but God's doing some good things and we want to endeavor to do a little better job ministering to different needs that are in the body. I have for the past, uh, tonight is part eight of our series. I've literally taught eight weeks on this topic of the principle of generosity and provision and I feel that I'm going to wrap it tonight. Um, I just feel the Holy Ghost impress me to spend the, the summer on it when I was in the pulpit on Wednesday nights. Um, there's honestly, there's several more directions that we could go and probably easily spend another two or three weeks on this, but um, I just feel the Holy Ghost has just said stop after tonight. So for those of you that would like to continue, I want to recommend three uh, books that I have been using among some other things, but these I would recommend. Probably the chiefest one that I've enjoyed is uh, by Roy Moss, and it's called The Lord's Portion. Uh, this was written by one of our own uh, ministers, pastors, and uh, this is an excellent book uh, on a study of tithing. Uh, it goes even, again, we just don't, I mean, we get, we said a lot of things in eight weeks. But if you want to go a little deeper, uh, Bill Winston has a book on the power of the tithe. Um, I enjoyed this. I found it, for, at least for me, not so much deep, but, but very inspirational. Uh, so it's not so much deep information, but very inspiring uh, reading. And <clears throat> this is the one I think many of you may want to spend a little more time in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend part two of it tonight. But uh, Neural Bennett wrote a book called Tithing and Still Broke. <laughs> and uh, exploring reasons why the people of God suffer lack and need. Now, we started talking about that last week, and the Spirit of God kind of led me on some things we got nowhere near done. I hope we will tonight. <laughs> but I'm going to do the second part of that. Uh, it comes from Joel chapter 1. Tell your children of it in verse 3. And let your children tell their children and their children another generation that which the palm worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, the cankerworm hath eaten. And that which the cankerworm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. We started talking last week about the four bugs that the Bible says destroy. And that's the palmer worm, the locust, the cankerworm, and the caterpillar. And we started talking about how to overcome infestations and uh, how to, to deal with that. And so I'm going to deal with the, the finish that thought tonight, and then I'm going to wrap this series, and I think next week we're going to head in another direction. Before we go on into nights, we'll do a super fast recap, but before we do anything, let's lift our voice and pray. Ask for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your, your anointing and your blessing, and appreciate the people that have been touched many lives have been touched through this series and i ask you to continue to bless those that watch through the internet and see it through our media department i'm asking you to continue to bless people in jesus name everybody said amen god bless you you may be seated in jesus name we were talking last week about the symbolisms of how that you can feel like you're going forward and yet something just eats up the progress and how many times financially we struggle with that. Um, and why am I dealing with that? Now the good news, if you'll bring up Joel 2, the Lord said in the next chapter, I'll restore to you the years that the locust, the cankerworm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm hath eaten. But the God noted that it was an army that he sent. And so what we have to recognize is that sometimes there are things that are kind of... <clears throat> chewing on us and and it's because God's trying to change a mindset or a behavior in us and so we started talking about motive testings and we started talking that about how generosity is not a get rich quick scheme as a matter of fact it's not any kind of a scheme at all it's a principle of God and he requires us to do right for the right reasons everybody said amen mm -hmm. We live in a world that is affected by the curse of original sin, uh, thorns and thistles. We talked about all this last week. I'm just recapping just a little bit. Uh, we talked about how all of us are working against a pressure that seems to be constantly pushing back. 
And so therefore we have to learn how to break through it. And that sometimes our lack is not always due to spiritual things. Sometimes we blame God and the devil for stuff that we did. It was not the devil that did what you did with that Visa card. <laughs> Yay, I say. Uh, if you're doing something biblically correct and getting a bad result, we got to stop blaming God and having fits about it. We talked about that last week. We got to get in our head. God's word settled. It's right. So if there's an error, it's on our part. We're not understanding something or we're, we're doing something incorrect and we need to find what it is. We talked about how most Americans are going to retire uh, in less than fruitful conditions, which is amazing considering we're the most wealthiest nation in the history of the world. Um, we talked about, and I think this is one of the things that in, impacted numbers of people, but the Bible says that if we would bring our tithe into the storehouse. He said, I, prove me that I will not pour you out a blessing. Everybody say a blessing. Mm -hmm. We talked about how that we just assume that that means money. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. The, the, the word is not money. The word is a blessing. And in the original Hebrew, if you go down to the root word of the Hebrew, it means to kneel as to receive a blessing. So think in your mind, Someone kneeling before the king or a queen being coronated. In other words, receiving honor. The Lord said, if you'll prove me with your stewardship, you will gain my favor. Now, with the favor of God comes all kinds of other uh, provisions that will come. All right. Uh, we talked about all this. So if you were not here last week, you need to go online, watch the series, get a CD, do something. Uh, because you missed a lot of good stuff that you need to get caught up on. And the reality is... If I look back over my life, sometimes we're more blessed than we think that we are. I literally read something this week that stunned me, and uh, I told my wife about it. I said, do you, un do you know what's amazing? I read this thing that if, if you fit into categories, these ABC things, and, and that you are in the top wealthiest 5% of people in the world. I told my wife, did you know that we are in the top 5% wealthiest people in the world? She didn't believe it either. <laughs> we sure don't feel like that. <laughs> uh, but again, we talked about the third world nation and how, uh, again, it, blessing the favor of God has to be rethought. It doesn't always mean money. Uh, and if that's the case, if you think that you have to have money in your pocket, to have the blessings of God, then that means probably most of the church throughout the world has somehow failed God. I don't want to stand before those great, wonderful saints and uh, tell them that they, they, uh, they should have prospered more uh, to have the blessing of God on their life. This thing getting over, folks. There's a lot of things that go on. So we dealt with all of that. It's not always about accumulated stuff, but sometimes God gives us provision week by week Month by month, year by year, we look back over our life and recognize there's been an enormous amount of provision that has been given to us. But we have not felt as if it was wealth because it was never accumulated in advance. And so we dealt with all of that. So uh, we talked about Timothy, where godliness with contentment is great gain. And God wants us to bring our needs to him. There are some of us right now that have needs just I'm encouraging you don't just run out and do it the way the world has taught you to do it slow down go to the altar spend some time in the prayer closet bring the need to God and give him time to do something creative with it well okay I know it's easier just to go get alone <laughs> but let God be God because that's really what he's after anyway um, we ended last week at Acts 17, if you'll bring it up on screen. This is where we ended. For in him we live and move and have our being. So we're going to pick up where we ended last week. Um, verse 29. For as much as then we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold and silver and stone and graven art of man's device. We, we have got to get the idea out of our head 
that somehow godliness is, is connected with wealth, financial wealth. Those are two different things. And uh, I want you to know something. God answers prayer, but he answers it on his own terms. Anybody been around long enough to say amen to that? Therefore, you and I need, as his people, need to stop uh, demanding that God perform for us. Thank you, brother. God, God doesn't have to jump just because we say jump. Now, oh, well, I'd never say that, Pastor. Well, that's true. You may not say it, but you'll skip church for two weeks in depression, moaning and mumbling around because you're aggravated at God because he didn't do something about it. Now, we're talking about the bugs that eat away. Let me show you one. James chapter 4, verse 2, he said, You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have and you cannot obtain. You fight, you war, yet you have not because you ask not. Now, what's interesting about that verse is he's saying you, a lot of things are eluding us because we're going after it by, by ways of flesh rather than bringing the need to God. And then when we do bring the need to God, we run into another canker worm. Verse 3 says, you ask and receive not because. Everybody yell because. Everybody say because. Punch your neighbor and say, pay attention to this. <laughs> Tell him it's going to help you. <laughs> because you ask what? A miss that you may consume it upon your lusts. When you did get around to bringing the need to God, you weren't bringing it to him with a pure motive. You were bringing your own agenda. To God, asking God to approve your agenda, rather than endeavoring to line up with his agenda. You know, can I share something with you? Some of you are so afraid of trusting God. And I got news for you. If you would just trust God and, and stop trying to manipulate everything, you would find out that God had bigger plans and ideas for you than you even had for yourself. As a matter of fact, God will take care of you better than you would take care of yourself. But the, the problem is that you're, you're one, but all you want to do is you're saying, God, give me, give me, give me, because I want to consume it myself. You adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So, huh. you want to tell you what a problem that many of us have in the house. If you want to see the New Testament pattern of how God thought the church ought to be, you go back to the Old Testament pattern of the, of the tabernacle in the wilderness. They called it the church in the wilderness. And God put the church in the center. Now, some of you put your career in the center. Some of you put your children in the center. Some of you put your spouse in the center. Some of you put some really strange things in the center. They're not even worthy of mention. <laughs> and we like to feel real justified about it. Yay, even holy. <laughs> but the pattern taught us that God said, put everything in the, put the church in the center and wrap every tent of Israel surrounded it and they all faced the tabernacle. In other words, the first thing they saw in the morning and the last thing they saw at night was what was happening toward the tabernacle of God. And the problem with many of us is uh, we're surrounded the tabernacle, but your household is not, is not uh, facing the, the, the church. Your household is kind of cockeyed. You're, you're, you're here, but your household is pointing over there. And this creates a lot of disruption. And I want to make God's house the priority of my house. 
and then live in the overflow because God's blessings flow when we align with his purposes. Again, God's taken better care of me through the years than I, I would have done on my own had I, had I followed the course that I was talking about going. Now, I didn't know that when I obeyed him. But it's an issue of just trusting God. But it's an issue of lining up with God's will, God's purpose, God's plan. The people of God can only come out of poverty when they seek his face and stop seeking money. Now, I'm talking about how to overcome these infestations. So we're asking amiss. That, that lets the bugs loose. Second Chronicles, a famous verse on screen. Can I remind you? He said it is when, when his people humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways. Then is when they're going to hear from heaven. Well, what does that mean? God says, get your household in alignment with my house. Get your tent pitched toward the things of God. Prove me, he said, that I will not pour you out a blessing. Now, we talked about that before. The word blessing was not meaning necessarily money, but the favor of God will come with it ideas and inspiration, motivation, concepts. Uh, God is not going to just, uh, when he wants to bless us, he usually does not just give us a bunch of money. What he does uh, is he gives us a way to use the gifts that he has already given us uh, to allow us to make provision. And then he blesses it. And most of the things that God gave us, he gave us that predominantly we should use toward the building up of his kingdom and we can also use those gifts and talents to make a living at but so many people get it twisted around and they use the things God's given them for their own gain and their own benefit uh, and then then want to look at the church and say well you know it had nothing to do with you it had nothing to do with God. It had nothing. This is my own work. This is my own thing. This is my no, 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 no. We are the children of God. We've been bought with a price. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's let's just worship him right now. I just I feel we need to just worship God for a minute. There's there's some Holy Ghost floating around in here tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is our job to seek the will of God in our life. It's not everybody else's job to seek the will of God for our life. We need to seek it. So many times we stay in neutral waiting for somebody to come along and kick us into gear. And the reason we want somebody to come and tell us what to do is because we don't want to expend any effort to figure it out ourselves. That's worthy of a sip of water, right? <laughs> Now, I will tell you this, if you will seek and endeavor to, you know, jiggle the handles and walk toward doors and try to, you know, God will give you those extra visitations you want to let you know whether you're on course or if you're barking up the wrong tree. He'll give you those things that you, he'll confirm things. I have found through the years that most of the prophetic words that I have received from the Lord throughout the years, the ones that are most impacting, were not the ones that told me something that I didn't know. It was the ones that confirmed to me what I already was feeling. I don't mean that they were lining up with my agenda. I mean, I felt like I'd already found what God was saying. But I wasn't totally sure. And then God comes and seals it. But we're wanting God to give us the answer to everything without expending any energy ourselves in seeking for it. And sometimes God will just get quiet on you until you decide to get off a neutral and start caring for this thing as much as he cares about it. He put us here, but he wants us to find our purpose in him. And really, at the end of the day, purpose is really the thing that will bring us fulfillment of life. It's not money. I know a lot of people that make a lot of money that are miserable. Now, I understand, if you're going to be miserable, well, I'd rather be miserable with money. <laughs> I mean, that's, that helps lessen the misery just a little. But it doesn't take it away. You know, and, and, and you don't, and I don't even mean just wealthy, wealthy people, but I mean, they're, they're, I know people that 
have great jobs or finance, but their marriages are a mess, houses are torn up, uh, no peace, all kind of, you know, it, it's more than that, folks. It's not about money. It's about having the favor of God, and it's about fulfilling your purpose. Brother Grimsley told me one time of a, of a multimillionaire that he met out traveling that took him to his uh, house and office and showed him all the things he owned and everything. And, and the reason that he wanted to talk to Brother Grimsley is he perceived he didn't have much of anything. And he asked him, he said, how can you be so happy? <clears throat> how can you feel so at peace? And so, uh, you know, and, and so what he was saying is, uh, how, how can you have so little and yet have so much? The people of God ought to be looking at the people of the world and saying, how can you have so much and have so little? <clears throat> when we focus on our eternal purpose, uh, our spirit gets better. And I want to tell you, you can chase money all day long, but making another $5 an hour is not going to make you feel fulfilled. It might help fill your gas tank, but it's not going to fill your spiritual tank. Only doing the will of God is going to do that. That classic passage, bring up uh, Genesis 22 when Abram had uh, Isaac on the mountaintop. And that drama was unfolding of, of you know, sacrificing thine son and the knife is in the air. And the angel of the Lord speaks and it stops all of it. And he says in verse 12, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. Now watch, for these are incredibly Four powerfully incredible words. God said, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast withheld thine son, thine only son from me. Now I know. One of Merle Ewing's songs that's so beautiful that was entitled after that very story has a beautiful line in the chorus that says, there are times and things and places that allow our love to show and the wondering is all over. Now I know. Yet God chose Abram all the way in the beginning and said, I believe he'll order his house after him. By the way, can I remind you that the reason God chose him to begin with had nothing to do with wealth or money or provision? It had to do with the fact that I think I can trust him with his household. He'll pitch his tent toward my program and he'll teach his children to do the same. And that brought the favor of God on. Now, my thinking is, is that God already called him because he knew of Abram's potential. He knew that, that he already knew in his heart that he, that, he, that he knew Abram. As a matter of fact, he was called a friend of God. And yet, despite the call of God on his life, he was still strongly tested. And I'm going to tell you that despite whatever call of God is on your life, you will also be called upon to prove what God thinks about your potential. It's not just proving it to him, but it's proving it to us. Because sometimes we say a lot of things in that altar on Sunday when we're feeling the presence of God. Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do. And we weep and cry. And then when God begins to use us and it costs some, then we change our tune. Oh, Jesus, you're using me. But oh, Lord, stop abusing me. Huh? Now I know. There are times and things and places that are key moment changers in our life where destinies are turned. And God said, no more testing. I am now convinced because he made us free will agents. And he knows what we can do. He knows what we're thinking about doing. And I believe the foreknowledge of God even knows what we will do. But whether he blocks that out of his mind or how he does it, I'm not exactly sure. But he does not just act on our potential. 
until he has tested us to find what our decision-making processes are going to be. And those decision-making processes can change the destiny of our life. Bring up Deuteronomy 8. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. That's what we've been talking about these last few weeks. That he may establish his covenant with you. Verse 19, that if, but if you forget at all the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve and worship them, I testify you, you will perish in the wilderness. Now, here's the point. It is astonishing to me as a pastor that's been here 26 years, and I have literally pastored literally hundreds of people coming and going. And it is astonishing to me how many people fail God in prosperity. And, and by the way, I might also add, it's amazing to me how little prosperity it takes for some to fail God. But I've seen numbers of people fail God in prosperity, and God doesn't have a problem with us being prosperous. He delights in it, as long as it's in Him. As long as our purpose and our motivation is Him. But the sad truth is, most people waste the financial gains that God gave us, because the first thing we do is just go out and buy a trinket. Okay, an electronic trinket. We buy a bunch of new stuff and new clothes and new this and new that instead of focusing in on first, what is God's purpose in this? We buy new video games instead of new tires for the car while we had the ability to do so. And then three months later, when it fails inspection, we're running back to God, wanting to know, God, I paid my tithe. How come, how come I got bald tires? <laughs> Sometimes you got bald tires because you got a, a, a brand new video equipment sitting in your house. It's a choice. I, you know, I, believe me, I understand. Buying a new set of tires is nothing romantic about that. <laughs> nothing make you feel better about yourself. <laughs> You'd rather rather spend money on something else. I'd, you know, let me do something with a little bling to it. Two tires, yeah. But I will tell you this: when you're flying down the road and see somebody sitting off the side of the road with a flat tire, then all of a sudden you feel better about yourself. <sighs> The Spirit of God is calling us to a dependency on Him because we're trying to get wealth but with our own way and we're trying to get out of debt with our own manipulation. We're not bringing it to Him. We are so hard-headed. We are determined to do this thing the way the world says to do it. And we hop like rabbits to their call. Instead of Listening to the Spirit of God. God may or may not want you to pursue what you're pursuing right now. God may have a better idea. Well, I, I don't know. What we really don't know is if we can trust God. Can I remind you, 2 Corinthians 9? Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, not of necessity. God loves a, a how, what kind of giver? cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful everything. But watch. He said, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you will have all sufficiency in all things, and may abound to every good work. God says, I'm able to take care of you. Now, that's a powerful passage. What he's saying is God is able to meet any need that we have. And I will say any legitimate need. Some of the things we call needs are not always what God calls needs. 
But here's where the battle comes down. And you want to talk about where we have infestations and where we have a lot of canker worms and palmer worms and all that. They eat away. Here it is. It is the battle is between our carnal nature and our spiritual nature. And we spend so much time on the carnal side of our nature. And the longer you spend there, you are breeding these infestations. You know, there's folks sometimes struggling with their walk of God, and they, they think, oh, man, I just can't, I, I don't know, it's just so hard to walk with God. I'm, I feel so weak. Let, let, me, let me tell you the reality of it. Your spiritual nature and the spiritual man in you can be incredibly powerful if you feed it. Now, if you feed the carnal nature, that gets strong. So if you spend all of your waking hours filling yourself with media and movies and all that kind of stuff, you're feeding the carnal man. But the thing that will build up the spiritual man is the word, preaching, teaching, singing, psalms, spiritual thing. And I have found through the years that most people have as much potential to be spiritually powerful as they are carnally powerful. So if you've ever had, if you've ever been totally controlled by your carnality, then I'm telling you, you are a candidate to also be totally controlled by your spiritual man. If you would do something about it. The carnal man rises up and tries to suppress the word of God in us, but the spiritual nature is not weak if we'll feed it. And we got to feed it and stop feeding the carnal nature. Tone it down. And raise up the feeding of the spiritual man. Because the spiritual wants to please God. But the flesh wants to please itself. And both sides of our nature can be incredibly powerful. Depending on which one we pursue. Every New Testament believer has the same choices as the first century church. We can either walk in the power of the apostles or we can walk in the deception of Judas. You know, going into that week, they were all still part of the fellowship together. But again, some of them had their tent pitched toward Jesus and others already had their tent tent pitched away from Jesus. Same here in that. We've got a number of you. you you're here, but you ain't here. <laughs> and sometimes people are fooled, and sometimes they're not at all. But one thing is for sure, God is never fooled. <clears throat> and we will tinker with carnality and deception until it hooks in its, into us and we become deceived. I'm going to be talking about that probably very soon. Talking about the spirits of deception and how they function. But know this, Galatians 6, bring it up. Be not deceived, verse 7 says. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. He that sows to his flesh shall reap flesh, corruption. You sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. And this isn't rocket science. This isn't all that hard. If you pursue spiritual things twice as much as you pursue carnal things, uh, you'll become very strong in God. So let us not be well weary in well-doing, but in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As I preached before, whatever dog we feed will become the dominant dog. We, they used to have the cartoons with the angel and the devil sitting on each shoulder talking, but really, I think a better true picture is two bulldogs sitting on our shoulders, and both of them are us. One's our natural nature, our, our carnal fallen nature, and the other's the spiritual side of whichever dog you feed the most, because they're the ones fighting all the time. Whichever one you feed 
will become stronger. And God said, know this, I will not be mocked. You are not going to feed the carnal dog and then blame me for why you're spiritually weak and failing. Why is it so quiet in here? Maybe we need another praise break right now. Lift your hands and your voice unto God. Let's chase that quietness out just a little bit. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you clap your hands under the Lord and praise Him? Jesus, help us today. The cares of this world will always exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. <clears throat> and I, I, we've got to stop allowing the cares of life to undermine how we think about God. Can I remind you that when we started this thing eight sessions ago of our theme, bring up Luke 6 and 38, give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, men will give unto your bosom for the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Why does that work? Because God is not mocked. He, he keeps track of this. And Satan will over, try to overwhelm you and overwhelm our giving with the cares of this world. But I want to show you something. Bring up John 15 and verse 7. Listen to these amazing words of Jesus when he said, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Everybody said amen. Mm -hmm. You believe it? Do you have faith in that word? Mm -hmm. Now I do want to point something out. Most of us think that it said that I can ask anything I want and I can have it. Some of us think that, well that's what it says, you shall ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. No, he didn't say it would be given, he said it will be done unto you. God was not offering to do everything that we wish for there, like some genie in the bottle. But he said, if you will abide in me, and if my words will be allowed to abide in you, I, I, he didn't say I'm going to give you something. He said, I'm going to do something in you. That word done in the original Hebrew, I do not know how to pronounce it. But I looked it up. I know how to spell it. But that's useless in this particular setting. Ginomahi, <laughs> gynomahi, mahu, <laughs> whatever. But here's the deal. <laughs> what it means is to arise, become assembled, and become finished. That's what the Hebrew word is. Now, all of a sudden, I'm seeing a new understanding of this verse. After we give, uh, so many of us are just waiting around for the blessing to fall. Okay, I paid my tithes. Now I'm going to sit around and wait until God does what he said he's going to do. And then when, that, when God doesn't bless our sometimes laziness or poor decision making, then we get a little irritated and we're wondering why the canker worm is walking off with our manna. Can you see it? Some snail is running off with your manna and you can't even seem to catch it. Talk about frustrating. <laughs> Get on... Ganamahi, I don't know, whatever the deal is, but it means to become fit. I'm thinking this is amazing. We're waiting for some moment of abundance to come. We're waiting for the check to come in the mail. We're waiting for that big moment of provision to happen. But what he really did was he said, if you will abide in me and let my word abide in you, I'm going to do a work in you. 
I'm going to complete you. I'm going to, I'm going to cause you to become assembled. In other words, I'm going to help you get your stuff together. I'm going to help you get your act together. Your life that's full of disorganization. Your life that's full of, of, of poor choices and all kinds of things. God said, if you'll let my word do its work in you, I'll mature you. I'll grow you up so that you're making better choices, which gives you better results. But we don't want that. What we want is just to skip the choices and get to the results. But God's not interested in just giving us a fish when we're hungry. He wants to teach us how to have a life more abundantly. He's not trying to solve our current circumstance. He wants to help solve something that becomes interwoven into the rest of our life. What God really wants to do is something in us, not just give something to us, to, to make us complete so if we can, we can live a life of abundance until, I'm hearing the words of the apostle when he said, until Christ be formed in you. John 10, 10 on the screen can I remind you that famous verse, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And just running from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis is not life abundantly. So if I'm in that mode, I need to bring it to Jesus. And I need to start letting his work do a work in me. And that doesn't happen just by coming to church. Amen. He didn't say if you'll come to church two or three times a week, I'll take care of you. That's not what he said. He said, you got to abide in me. And my word has to abide in you. That's the only thing that'll, that'll do this change in us. And what I'm saying is drawing close to Jesus changes us on the inside. And as that song we used to sing, I've got Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Makes us focus on better priorities. Helps us get direction. I, I have watched people come into the house of God in all sorts of various conditions. And I've watched as they begin to engage the word and engage the spirit and the preaching and the teaching begin to engage them. And I've watched some turn around and run. <laughs> and they just leave out of here. And they'll say, I, I, you know, y'all, it's just, it, it's, it's too much for me, which that's kind of amazing. I, I thought you came to church because you're wanting something overwhelming. <laughs> Then we have some overwhelming services and everybody wants to run from it. So ah, you're all too, you're all too intense for me. And I, I often say, well, yeah, I mean, this is high test. I, I give you that. And, uh, burns hotter. <laughs> but it burns better. <laughs> and it'll take you places you want to get in the spirit. But you know what? Sometimes that stronger teaching and preaching and the strong presence of God, sometimes what it really does is it burns through our false motive and we find out that we're not really near as hungry for Jesus as we were saying that we were. We were just wanting to feel better about ourselves for a little while. But we're not really wanting to have, have change in us. Our greatest need is not money. Our greatest need is Jesus. Is there anybody that can testify with me tonight? Oh, hallelujah. Lift your voice with that hand clap. And let's just take another moment of praise. Hallelujah. For those of you that are just seeking money, understand there's not enough money in the world to erase spiritual hunger. You can't get successful enough to where you don't need God anymore. My observation is, is that financial issues drain joy out of our life. They sap marriages. They put all kinds of stress on, on the households. But understand, financial gain doesn't always automatically just fix all that. Because the point is, is our issues are not just money. Finances are a part of our life. And they're certainly an important part of our life in so much as everything that we do requires funding. But if the funding becomes 
the main thing that we're pursuing. Now, the world can do it and can get away with it for a second, but the people of God can't. The Israelites could not get away with what the Philistines did. And when you pursue money as a child of God, if you're going to proclaim yourself to be a child of God, I promise you, just pursuing money, it'll elude you. Because some of us have turned these things into an idol. Where our house, our tent is, that's what our tent is pitched towards. It's pitched to this idol. It's not pitched to the things of God. We're just not seeking Jesus the way we need to. And, I, you know, can I share something, a little, just a little personal note? I am so weary of people complaining about the church. This is one of the most powerful churches that I know. Missionaries and executives and pastors come and visit us and are asking me, how, how do you get into that place? And yet half of us are walking around. You know, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> You're sowing to the wrong dog. You're being so ungrateful for the incredible thing. Let me tell you something. If you can't walk with God in this atmosphere, with this kind of fellowship, teaching, preaching, Spirit, all this. You're the ones broke. Ain't nothing wrong with the church. That's right. Hallelujah. So offended me. I'll grow up. Somebody's always going to offend you. You're always going to have problems. You know. But, you know, just be careful that you never offended anybody with some of your dumb statements, too. You want to walk around with some great, wonderful badge of wounding because <laughs> somebody hurt me. You ought to realize how many people you hurt with some of your foolish words and you're on again, off again, support of the kingdom and in and out and all, and people pour into your life and get back nothing but ingratitude. Just having a little personal moment there. <laughs> You can't walk with God in this. There's, there's something broke about you. Something's wrong inside of you. You know what it is? You've got to have the one to. And sooner or later, eventually, what it all boils down to is that there's a lot of folks, they get a little troubled in their life. They get sick. They get marriage problems. Kids got problems. They come running to the church. God, I need your help. I'm really sorry. I want to walk with you. I want to. And then life gets a little ease. God starts blessing. The word starts working. And all of a sudden, I get satisfied again, and I drift away. Because really, what the real issue is, ain't nothing, it got nothing to do whatsoever with the church. It has nothing to do with anything except the truth is, I'm just kind of full and busy of the things of the world. And I'm just not all that hungry for the things of God. That's, that's really what it is. Bring up Ecclesiastes 10. I, I, I've only got a few minutes. Let me take you here. Verse 17. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. You know what he's saying there? You're blessed if you're able to live under a steady, stable government leaders. Because a lot of the world isn't. But you, you know, crooked government leaders can also be incredible canker worms and palmer worms, taxing the death out of our, our increase. And, and but watch verse 18. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth. And through idleness, the hands of the house drop through. In other words, things need maintained. You know, God can give you a free car, but you still got to change the oil. That people never change their oil in their car. Drive it eight, nine, ten thousand miles and wonder why it blows up. <laughs> then God spend money on a cleaning carpets. That's one of my biggest frustrations. 
We're going through it right now. It costs us a few thousand dollars a year, two or three thousand dollars a year, just to clean the carpets in our facilities. And it's so frustrating. But the reality is, we have $75,000 worth of carpets based on the prices back when we did all of our renovation. And the reality is, is that it's not people walking on carpet that wear it out. It's not, it's not, it's people coming in with things on their shoes and the little dirt and the salts and the uh, sand granules. And it gets in the carpet and then people walking on that and rubbing the, the nylon against it. That's what wears the carpet out. And so you're either going to spend money on occasional cleaning and, and get years more service. But again, there's nothing exciting about getting your carpets clean. Got a blessing this week. Usually the first thing that comes to our mind is not, I'm going to clean the carpets, son. But sometimes that's where we got to have that new kind of thinking that comes from God when we start getting excited about making decisions that, that, that bless the long term of our life. We tend to just run out and do something that just makes us happy today. Verse 19, a feast is made for laughter, the wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Curse not the king, don't... Do not it in, in your thought, or curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for the bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath the wings shall tell the matter. It, 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 you know, when, you're, when your voice is contrary to leadership in your life, it always becomes known. One translation said, feasting will cheer you up, but it still costs money. A lot of translations render this as money. Money answers everything. Money does everything. Money will fix everything. And yet we know that money is not the answer to everything. As a matter of fact, Jesus indicated that it would not purchase salvation. He said, what is a man gained if, or profited if he gained a whole world and lose his own soul? So Jesus was not <clears throat> advocating the fact that money is everything. He even indicated or the Apostle Paul, excuse me, indicated that many have sought after it and have pierced themselves with sorrows. So the, I, I don't think that's what that verse is, is saying to us. And I went back to that original Hebrew word, ana, that means to eye or to heed or pay attention to. In other words, paying attention to money answereth all things. Watching the budget will solve the problems. The financial report will answer everything, Solomon is saying. You want to know what's really going on? Take a look at the finances. Take a look at how money is being spent. Take a look at how choices are being made. Follow the money. It'll give you the answers that you're looking for. And what I think in this past eight weeks the Spirit is saying to our church is, okay, follow the money. Follow your stewardship. It will give you answers to all kinds of issues that are going on in your life. When you see how you choose to manage those things, it will show you also how other things unfold. It's important to learn how finances work. Study to show thyself approved is not just something that you do for the Bible, but since we live in a world that takes finance, we need to learn a little bit about how money works. We need to learn about balancing checkbooks and, and, and doing that kind of stuff. All the stuff that they never bothered teaching you in school. For some strange reason. This causes us to make better decisions. This causes us to pay more attention and better choices make better results. The reality is, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to start to wrap here, but the reality is this. Immaturity is probably our biggest battle. And immaturity means that we're not really ready to function in the capacity that God meant for us to function in. God has plans for us. 
but we, he can't get us to him because of our immaturity. Wealth can cause the immature to miss God's best for their life because they get so enamored with their new job or their new money. They get so fixated on it, they think that by finding money, they found God. And that's not always the case at all. So understand that generosity is the basis upon which we manage our life. Generosity should be the default setting. It's kind of like putting windows on the computer. It, it, it isn't going to fix all of your needs, but it creates an operating system upon which everything else can flow. And generosity is, is, the, is the issue that ought to flow. And from generosity, again, giving itself does not solve the problems. We have to learn some management issues. And sometimes the thing that's eating, the infestation that's eating us up is not that we haven't given, it's that we haven't managed well. And we need God's wisdom in how to do it. Now, let me tell you something. There's times when you're even managing well. And still things are eating. You have to go back and say, God, what is this? What is it? I remember years ago, uh, way back in Cary Avenue days, I had an issue that had risen up in the church, and I had to make a decision about something, and it was whether or not I was going to give to it. And I had a question in my mind as to whether or not it was a, uh, the, the people that we were given to was, you know, going to, if it was really going to do anything or not. And I remember standing outside of my, standing next to my car outside of the church, and I said to God, uh, Lord, do I do, I do this? I, I just don't know if I should do this. Because, I, again, I, I'm responsible for stewardship. And I'll never forget the Lord speaking to me something that has lasted all these years. He simply quoted, again, the Word of God. Cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days, it will come back to you. In other words... If you're gonna if you're gonna stall and judge, and stumble over every daily thing, you, you're you're just gonna have to understand, not every seed I plant is gonna produce, not everything I give to is gonna come back, but enough of it is gonna come back. After many days, it shall come back to you. Cast your bread upon the waters. Do what you know is right to do. Manage well. So I'm saying to some of you who are good managers and you're still having canker word problems, understand there's going to come a time when you pass this Isaac, Abraham test uh, that God's going to turn around. He said, all right, I'm going to restore to you the years uh, that the, the, the canker worm and the palm worm have eaten. Uh, he, he said, I'm going to restore everything uh, that was robbed from you now that I was able to teach you my ways. It may take many days, but if you'll stay the course. But immaturity doesn't allow us to stay the course. Immaturity will cause us to get frustrated and take turns. You know, how, you know when you're on a trip and you don't trust the map, that's our dangerous place to be. <laughs> I usually trust my GPS. But there's a couple of times that rascal has messed me over. And there's a few times I was trying to play and they kept me, I'm thinking, you know what, I, I don't think this thing knows what he's doing. And you lose confidence in that voice. You're all messed up. You got nothing else you can do but find a physical map. And even when the voices become a little confusing, like, get yourself to the word. The answer to every issue you're facing is in the word. Maybe a little hidden, but if you'll study, if you'll hunger after it. James 1, bring it up, my last verse. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask it of God. God will give it to all men liberally. It, it shall be he who prayed not. He's not going to withhold it. Study these things. Look for management principles that fit the word and not the world. Don't just assume because the world's doing something 
that it's right. I remember a few years ago when everybody was going crazy, when, when, when the, you know, people were buying houses for more than they even appraised for. And banks were loaning for, I thought this is the most insane, stupid stuff that I've ever seen. And yet, many people were fooled because the smart people <laughs> were all doing it. I took it to God in prayer. I said, God, should I be doing this? And the Holy Ghost would said, stay out of it. Yes, sir. Thankful to God that I did. I'm telling you, folks, we have more confidence in the world instead of confidence in God. And it's, it's not serving us well. But for the people of God, everything great started with an ordinary person that had an idea. They took time to work on it. I've watched God through the years bless people. Don't have a college education. Never went to a specific school. Never had any particular training in particular thing. But God just chose to bless them. Gave them an idea. And they were faithful to it. Began a business or whatever. And I've seen some in the house of God through the years as I evangelized and traveled. Some with incredible testimonies. <clears throat> Saw one that was a, a drug dealer that got saved in the church out in, in one of the churches in Indiana. And he, he started a little side business just uh, putting markers on the highways. And he ended up getting, after a few years, some contracts to where he was doing half the state of Indiana. Blessing the church left and right. All big, no, no training, no, no special. But it's just, just listening to the voice of God. And I'm feeling so strong in the Holy Ghost tonight to tell you, start seeking Him. And let Him be your provision. Lift your voice. As a matter of fact, stand together. We're out of time. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your voice. And I want you to just pray right now. Dear Jesus, we love you. And Lord, tonight I loose this last chapter of this eight-part series. Lord, I've talked about generosity and how it leads to your provision. We've talked about tithing and offerings. We've talked about, about the law, interacting and what's for us and what's not for us. And, God, we've dealt with all of those issues. And tonight I loose this entire series into us. And I'm asking you, God, deal with our hearts. Teach us to think like you. Help us to learn to trust you. Help us to get our households pitched toward the tabernacle of God. Get our mindsets and our families looking toward the things of God. And then learning to live in the overflow of how God makes provision for our lives. We give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. And all over this house, I want you to lift your voice now and begin to worship God. And thank God.